morning. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah 35, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 this morning, Isaiah 35, 1 uh, through 10. Uh, so this Advent season, uh, we're looking at the book of Isaiah. As many of you know, as I mentioned last week, uh, over the last year, we've spent much of our time in the book of Luke. Uh, Luke draws a lot from Isaiah earlier uh, this year in life groups. We studied the book of Isaiah, so I just feel it's fitting, and the Lord is going to use uh, this time in this Advent season as we look uh, back uh, to the incarnation. We look forward to Christ uh, coming again upon his return to hang out in the book of Isaiah. And today uh, we're going to look at joy uh, that we find in these verses. I'd ask you to think with me for a second about a time uh, in your life, and maybe that time is now. Uh, Maybe it's a season uh, that's gone past, uh, but a time in your life uh, when you were happy. When you were happy, uh, maybe uh, things were just going your way. Uh, maybe you had a, a new house. Maybe you got a new car. Maybe you got the uh, promotion. Uh, whatever it is, think of a time in your life uh, when you were happy. When you're happy, and then what were the the circumstances surrounding that? Was it just something that you got? Was it something that was going uh, your way? What was it uh, in that season, in that time, that was that caused you to have this feeling of, of happiness? Uh, For Crystal and I, I got married uh, pretty young. I got married really young. Uh, Within the first couple of years, we welcomed our our first child. Uh, Over the last 20 years, uh, another few kiddos came along the way. But just many, many years of of happy moments. Uh, By God's grace, uh, much of my life, um, I would say I've had a, a mostly happy uh, happy moments, happy times. Uh, serving in the local church in a number of, of different roles uh, have just really uh, had blessed and, and happy times even in that. But when we think about happiness, uh, what I want you to just kind of bring to the forefront of your mind while we're thinking uh, about this thought is what were the circumstances around that and then the reality, the, the truth that happiness is circumstantial. Because seasons will change. Circumstances will change. It can seem like it's all going our way uh, one day, and then the next day it's just completely coming undone. Happiness is circumstantial. While we long for happiness, while I I hope uh, that you're happy, uh, happiness is circumstantial. It can change in an instant. But but here's the deal, though. Uh, Because Jesus came, God in the flesh, because he lived a sinless life, because he died on the cross, because he overcame the grave, we say he's he's Lord and he's Savior. Uh, We have saving faith. Uh, We have something better than than happiness. We have joy. We have joy. Joy in all circumstances. Joy in every season. And what I want you to hear is that, that joy and happiness, they're not synonyms. They're not synonyms, all right? Joy, biblical joy, is choosing to respond to external circumstances with inner contentment and satisfaction because we know that God will use these experiences to accomplish His work in and through our lives. So wherever you find yourself today, whether it's a season of happiness or a season of of unhappiness, what I want you to see in God's word today is the joy uh, that we have in Christ. So if you would stand, let us look at God's word, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 35, I'm going to cover all 10 verses of this chapter this morning. God's word says, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom like a crocus, it shall blossom abundantly. And rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They they shall see the glory of the Lord. The majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands. And make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart. Be strong. Fear not. Behold your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he he will save, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. And the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. 
and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beasts come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. And they shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is God's word. Let us pray. God, we thank you uh, this morning to together in this place. God, we thank you uh, so much for what has happened already. Our kids singing a report uh, for what you're doing on the other side of, of the globe as the gospel is going forth. God, we thank you for the worship team leading us in song. And God, we thank you for this moment where we can look at your word. God, our prayer today is that you would speak to us. God, that hearts would be convicted. God, that ha- hearts would be comforted. That, that hearts would, would see of the truth of the joy that we have through the work of Christ. God, for me, God, I pray that you make less of, of, of me and more of you. God, speak to your people now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So in this uh, text, uh, we find here in the book of Isaiah uh, the, the, the truth, the fact that because of their sin, judgment is coming, uh, but amidst that judgment is a future hope. A future hope is coming for them. And they can still have joy that even though due to their sin there, there's judgment coming, they can still have joy because of uh, who God is and what he is going to do. But for the first 34 chapters of the book of Isaiah, joy is rather hard to find. But today we will see it in these verses. And I just want you to know that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you brought in here, no matter what's happening in your life, uh, I want you to leave today knowing that in Christ you have joy. So the point that I want you to, to walk away with is this big idea. We have joy in every season of life. Through the redemptive and restorative work of Christ. We have joy as God's people. We have joy in every season of life through the redemptive and restorative work of Christ. Uh, Two points uh, for us from these verses. First, joy through the transformational work of Christ. Joy through the transformational work of Christ. So you have this book uh, with, that has judgment but also uh, hope. Uh, there's this near future judgment but this distant future hope. Uh, and thinking all the way back to creation, we, we approach this book and uh, the brokenness uh, of this place, the brokenness of, of humankind is on our minds. But, but, but we think back to creation. Back when God created it all, there was no hurt, there was no pain, uh, there was no death. But through the transgression of mankind in Genesis chapter 3 sin enters the world and all is changed through Eve's lack of trust in God's commandment as a result all is broken in Isaiah chapters 28 through 33 a big issue was really that this stupid advice from the leaders that God's people should trust Egypt Which is why I believe Isaiah 34 is one of the darkest passages in all of Scripture. And then in chapter 36, the chapter right after our our text today, the Assyrian officer would laugh at the idea of trusting God. So I think there's something that lies within these verses today, this underlying question of do God's people trust Him? Do you trust Him? And I don't know about for you, but for me, one of the things that, that strengthens my faith, uh, one of the things that, that caused me to, to lean in and to trust God is to zoom out a little bit. I think sometimes we get caught up in all the day-to-day, everything that, that's right in front of us, that the pain, the loss, the hurt, these feelings of, of happiness or, or sadness. I think it's helpful for us to remember who our God is and to zoom out a little bit. To look at over my life following Jesus, what he has done, how he has proven himself faithful and trustworthy time and time and time again. 
we, we zoom out a little bit and we think about our lives and all that God has done. Sometimes we just go through life with, with blinders on, forgetting who God is, what he's done, how he's using us. We, we forget that. we got to zoom out just a little bit. we got to understand our entire story. And when we look at Scripture, I would argue the same thing. We've got to zoom out. We've got to look back at what's called the, the meta narrative of Scripture. What is the, the story that, that Scripture is, is telling as a whole? What is it all fitting together to say, telling this story of creation, the fall, redemption, and, and restoration, this, this big story? So we step back a little bit. It causes us to lean into trust God more, knowing that what He said He's going to do, He does. But because of brokenness, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ steps into, steps into this messed up place. He, God puts on flesh to dwell uh, among us. So while all seems dark here in this portion of the book of Isaiah, there's this word of encouragement. This word of encouragement that, that something is going to happen. Isaiah speaks to the people from God. He, he speaks to the people this, this big story of what is to come. But look at verses 1 and 2. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of, of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. So, so track with me. Uh, because of sin, uh, we live in a broken place. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, the curse came upon the earth. Eden was this place that was lush, but what was lush and what blossomed turned to thorns and to thistles. And while there's still beautiful places on this earth, like the ones mentioned here in verse 2, Lebanon, Carmel, Sharon, that they pale in comparison to the beauty uh, they once had and the beauty they will have again once all is restored. So to make sure you're, you're thinking about this, that it's not just me and it's not just you that are jacked up because of sin. Our whole earth doesn't function as it should because it's broken. In Romans 8, it says, For we know that the whole earth has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Like, let that picture sink in. Well, what's happening on our earth right now is like the, the groans, the, the labor pains. And while I don't have a lot of experience with that personally, uh, you can call me old school, but I believe that it's only women that can have uh, babies. Uh, I don't really care what the little emoji says with the guy that looks like a guy with a, a beer belly or something like that, but I think it's like a pregnant uh, guy. Is what the, I, I'm old school. I believe that it's only women that can have babies, so I haven't experienced that personally. I haven't experienced that personally, but I've been uh, in close proximity to that now four times with all four of our kids, and needless to say, you know something's going to happen. Like, it becomes pretty obvious, right? There's the swollen ankles. There's the random cravings like Big Red and, and beef jerky or, or whatever. Like, you know something is coming. And then it gets more and more serious as it gets closer. Then the day comes. The day comes when uh, birth is going to be given. And then it becomes really apparent that something's going to happen. There, there's groaning. There's pain. There's this struggle. And again, just from witnessing it, it looked like it was pretty painful. It looked pretty painful. There was some groaning. There was a, a struggle. But what came from that struggle was something beautiful. Something beautiful. Uh, what came from that struggle was Kinsley and Kennedy and Lincoln and, and Lyric. What came from that struggle it was something beautiful, the groaning, the pain, the time spent with the swollen ankles. It was worth it because what came from that is something beautiful. See, what Isaiah is trying to say here is like a mom giving birth. Something beautiful is coming from the struggle. There's more to the story than the pain. There's more to the story than the hurt. What Isaiah is communicating is all things are going to be made new. 
The earth groans now, but it will in fact be restored. It will blossom. It will be given its glory. Church, you got to understand that the earth is cursed. Uh, this barren land that will be restored. But we are, as well, we're spiritually as a dry desert. And because we live in this broken, sp- this broken place, because we're a broken people, there's mental health issues, there's physical health issues. Uh, some of the older brothers and sisters in the room will uh, testify that, uh, guess what, our bodies break down over time. Verse 3, it talks about strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. See, because of Genesis chapter 3, our hands become weak, our our knees become feeble. My dad likes to say that getting old ain't for wimps. Getting old ain't for wimps. Like like you become aware, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a really old man, at least I don't think I'm old, my my kids think I'm old, but I'm aware now that my body isn't meant to last forever this side of glory. You get up and your back hurts and like, I didn't even do anything yesterday. Like, like what, what happened here? Like, there's evidence of the, the fall uh, in our physical bodies. They begin to break down. Our hands become weak. Our knees become feeble. But back uh, from Genesis chapter 3 is, is the reason uh, we get sick. It's the reason our bodies fail us. It's because we're living in this broken space. The earth works against us. The garden that we try to plant every spring dies when you give up in August when it's 110. The garden dies. Uh, We have traffic. There's bugs. There's high gas prices. There's crooked politicians. Uh, Our Dallas Cowboys haven't won a Super Bowl since since 95. Like like all the bad stuff. Uh, There's people uh, that that cook a a really good cut of meat to to well done. They just burn it to a crisp. Like all the bad stuff that that happens in in this world is a result of the fall. So you ask, why the bad stuff? Because we live in a broken place. It's a busted up, jacked up, broken place that we live in. There is loss. There is death. There is illness. And so you're probably thinking, brother, this doesn't sound very joyful. Where is the joy? Well, to understand the joy that you have, you've got to understand how messed up it is. And the joy comes in verse 4. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Church, here's the transformational moment. Here's when we can have joy. As we live in this broken place, we can rest in this truth that there's a solution, and the solution is Jesus. Church, hear me. The solution is Jesus. The prophet Isaiah speaks here from God and says to those that are anxious, be strong, don't fear. God will come with recompense, meaning to make amends for for suffering. There will be physical restoration. And even in the near future to this text, uh, Ezra and and Nehemiah would see some restoration uh, in the people of God. But that would pale in comparison to the future joy that Jesus would fulfill. All of this is pointing somewhere. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God find their yes. Church, they find their yes in him. This is why it is uh, through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. It says here in the middle of this book of Isaiah where where judgment is coming but there is a a future hope. It says that there's going to be joy. There's going to be joy because what? He will come and save you. He will come and save you. So what we think about this time of year is God came down to Earth and the person of Jesus, the incarnation, fully God, fully man, lives a sinless life. The life that I can't live, the life that you can't live. Then he goes to the cross. He pays the penalty that we should have paid. Then he overcomes the grave. He conquers sin. He conquers death. And we repent and we believe that this promise here in Isaiah fulfilled in in him and the work that he accomplished. He came to do that work to, to fix our broken souls through the atoning blood. Of Jesus, through the atoning blood of Jesus. He transforms what, what was death into life. He makes it new. He restores us. We're restored. 
So no matter what you face in this season or, or in a season in the future, you can sing with joy. You can be joyful because of what he's done. Church, this time of year, I, I, hope, you, I hope you get this. I hope it's, it's sinking in. That no matter what you're going through, you have joy because of Jesus. You got joy because of Jesus. The one that redeems and that restores all the mess of this place. The one that makes this wasteland here into this lush utopia in the future. The one that takes dry land. You ever left here and went west? There's a whole bunch of nothing. But desert. And lostness. And bad football teams. But, but you, you leave here and you go west. And there's just desert. Like picture this. You leave here one day when heaven comes down in the new creation. You leave here and you go west and it's nothing but like lush utopia. Like that's the picture here. Dry land and tumbleweeds turns into blossoms. But church, hear me. The text is saying that the earth groans now. That we, we long to see it. But the, the signs and the miracles that, that Jesus did in his time here on earth, they, they, they point us. They, they point us to the truth that he's going to come back and the joy that we have in him. So the first thing that we see is joy through transformational work of Christ. Joy through the transformational work of Christ. Secondly, joy revealed in our lives. Joy revealed in our lives. So if, if this is true... If you know Christ, if you put your faith in him, you understand what has happened. You understand that you have been transformed through the work of Christ. Nothing of your own doing. Like You let that sink in, and so you have this joy within you that circumstances can't take away from you. If that's you, if you know Jesus, then that joy should be revealed in your life. It should be revealed in your life. I just wonder how often we, we come in here and then we leave here and we go out into the world and we, we don't look like a joyful people. Like, why would people want any part of this Jesus? We're professing to be the King and the Redeemer and the Savior. If we just go walking through life, always on the down and outs, not looking like we have hope, not looking like we have joy. Church, family, we should be a joyful people. It should be revealed in our lives. Look at verses 5 through 7. Like if you let this sink in, the only response is joy. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water and the haunt of jackals where they lie down the grass shall become reeds and rushes. See, we see here more, more that comes from this, this joy of those that have been redeemed. Blind eyes are open. Deaf ears hear. The, the lame, they don't just walk. Look at the text. They don't just walk. They, they leap like a deer. And yes, church, hear me. We're talking about physical wholeness. We're talking about physical wholeness. But what I want you to catch, we're also talking about spiritual wholeness wholeness like let it sink in what was spiritually blind now has sight what's spiritually blind now has sight what is spiritually deaf now has hearing that which was spiritually unable to move now runs now leaps church these are problems that you can't fix these are problems that are only fixed in christ he wakes us up to new life. He makes dead things alive. This is the promise. Church, hear me. This is the promise. The reality of that deep within us should cause us to be a people that are joyful, that are happy, that are excited, that are living a life that says there's something more in us. There's something more that has happened to us. There's something more to come than this broken world that we live in. Church family, we got to get that. We got to live that. People got to see that in us, that we're a joy filled people. Verse 6 says, Waters break forth in the wilderness or the desert. It says, Burning sand becomes a pool. 
Y'all know this about me. I'm a beach guy. I'm a summer guy. The, the tanner I get, the happier I am. So I, I've been on many, many hot beaches, and your, your feet are just scalding. You're like running to get under the canopy or to the water. Imagine that sensation, and then think about putting your feet in a cold pool. That's the transformation that's happening. The transformation is that, that God makes that which is uninhabitable, not only inhabitable, but glorious. He makes it glorious, church. He makes it glorious. What is uninhabitable in us, our dead, lifeless soul because of sin, he makes inhabitable through the work of the Holy Spirit. Hearts are regenerated. We're brought to life. We're given ears to hear. We're given eyes to see. We, we run. What was lifeless is running. That should make you say, behold our God. Verse 4, behold our God. Behold your God. The reality of this should cause you to burst into joy. It should burst into joy. This truth, this truth of the transformation that has happened in us, does that spur you? To have a joyful spirit. So, so what do you do? You, you should follow the truth. You should follow God. You should follow the one that, that transformed your heart. You should follow him daily. Like for us, until we die or until he returns, sin is going to keep trying to get us off track. We live in this broken place. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be pain. There's going to be loss. But in every season, we, we press in. We, we press in knowing that we have a joy that can't be taken from us by circumstances. And Isaiah uses this imagery of what it looks like to live out this life. He likes to use this imagery of a, a path or a highway. Look at verse 8. And a highway shall be there. And that shall be called the, the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Look at this, even if they are fools. Amen? Man, I'm the, I'm the chief among fools. And this is good news. This is good news. You should be joyful about this. You should be joyful because even if they are fools, check it, they shall not go astray. This highway imagery here. Like, I don't know if you've traveled around the country a whole lot, but we have a ton of highways here. Like, quite a bit more than you would see in a lot of places. I mean, there, there's 30, there's 35, there's 35E, there, there's 20, there's 67, there's the total. There, there's highways everywhere. But during this time, to Isaiah's audiences, highways weren't quite what they are today. Uh, as you might suspect, they didn't have uh, the construction capabilities and technology that we do now. But also, this is an audience that's in a pretty mountainous terrain. And so you'd have to have a, a long, flat space to get this highway or this, this path. But this highway, what does a highway do? It, it takes you somewhere. You get on it to go somewhere. Somewhere what? Far away most of the time. You're getting on the highway because it takes you somewhere. And the on-ramp to this highway that Isaiah is talking about, the on-ramp is Jesus. The on-ramp is Jesus. The on-ramp is Christ. And for those that get on this highway through the work of Jesus. They, they move forward at this steady pace towards what? Towards holiness. Church, this path, this highway, this way to holiness here, it's the place where the redeemed walk. And catch this, uh, the path itself isn't glory, but it leads there. And you don't get on this highway in your own doing, in your own might, in your own good works. You get on the highway because of Jesus. But it's taking you somewhere. And guess what? Even the fools, even the fools can't get off of this thing because they didn't put themselves on it. Jesus did. Like even a fool can get on through the work of Christ. But, but check this out. The markers on this way to holiness, they don't say 100 miles to, to Memphis. I don't say that. The markers on this road, this way to holiness, they say die to self. They say love your neighbor. They say kill sin. They say run to Jesus. That's what the markers say on this way of holiness. 
that even fools can, can progress forward through the work of Christ. And church, it's a toll road of sorts. But the toll's already been paid. The toll was paid with the blood of Jesus. Look at verse 9. On this way of holiness, no lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Listen, church, this is a place where the redeemed move in holiness, putting off the old self, putting on the new self. This is the place that those have been restored in Christ. This is the, the movement they take on this path. They continue on this path of, of holiness with joy. Uh, the cars that, that travel on this highway of, of holiness, uh, the ones that take this way, these cars are, are wrapped with joy. They're wrapped with joy, and they continue on this path. Even when you face struggles, even when seasons aren't going as you plan, you continue on this way. And it's not marked by happiness. It's marked by joy. You're filled with joy, and you, and you notice it. You, you notice it as you move along this highway of, of holiness. And God's people, they're joyful as they move along, as their cars have joy written all over them. A, a flat tire comes along the way. A, a fender bender, because... There's fools on the road. Like, you've been to Dallas? Yeah, that. Uh, you got fools on this highway to holiness redeemed in Christ, but they're, they're fools. They're, there's busted up fenders. They're, there's things not going how you want. Your transmission uh, might go out, but the destination, the destination is still glory. The destination is still glory. How is that? Verse 10, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The thought here is that joy overtakes the redeemed. In Deuteronomy 28, 2, there's this verse that says, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. The, the idea is that you're conquered by joy. You're conquered by an army of joy. You're overtaken by it. So much so that it's evident in how you interact in every situation. Church, if you're here today, I pray, I really hope that you're in a happy space, that you have a happy season, that you're doing well. But no matter what's going on, no matter what's going on, if you're in Christ, you have joy. Joy because you've been redeemed. Joy that your dead soul was given life. Joy that you've been restored through the work of Jesus. Joy as you await, as you await his return. As you know that, that in the end, all that is wrong will be made right. You have joy that this broken, busted up place is going to be restored entirely. Church, hear me this morning. If, if you know Christ, you have joy. Joy that can't be taken away from you because of the transformational work of Christ. But hear me, we can't just leave it there. As we go down this highway of holiness, that joy should be revealed in our life. Church, people should see it on us. We shouldn't just look like a bunch of grumpy church folk showing up on Sundays. We should be joyful. Even when our world is crumbling around us, we should be joyful. We should say, hey, there's something more. There's something more. Jesus, he, he changed my heart. Jesus is going to bring all this back together. We, we move forward with joy being revealed in our lives. We can have joy in every season. We can have it in every season through the redemptive and restorative work of Christ. We often say around our church that we want to be a church that is for the community. And so, so many of you are just great examples of what that means. One of those families, those couples, are Jeff and Julie Poole. Many of you know them. Uh, Jeff's one of our deacons. They, they've served uh, this church and our community well for, for many, many years. In a great number of ways, they show the joy of Christ to our community. For years, they, they put on a toy drive. And every Christmas, there's a lot of happy kids in our community. 
because of the work that they do and because of how all of you in our community kind of locks arms with them in that. We have a lot of happy kids that many are blessed through the work that they do. A great number, a great number of us have joined them in that effort. But a few years ago, a few years ago, another family here in the church that's close with them, Jason and Stephanie Moss, they lost their daughter, Kaylee, who was in her 20s at that time. And in honor of her, the pools named the toy drive Kaylee Slay. And through our entire community pulling together, Yesterday, over 200 families came here to the church and will have gifts for their kids. And we'll see a lot of happy kids again this year. And praise God for that. Like, praise God for that. Great work to, to all of you that, that helped in that. Praise God for it. But, but you want to know something else. Many people walked into the doors of this place yesterday that we had conversations with that were unchurched. Like, like maybe you're here today because you came in yesterday and allowed us to minister to you. Like there's this unchurch in our community that hopefully will join us for, for worship. But, but catch this church, catch this, three people through the evangelism efforts of people in our church yesterday, three people put their faith in Christ. And praise God for that, yes, a- amen, amen. But praise God for that, because yes, we want kids in our community to be happy, we want them to have a great Christmas, but what we want more than that. It's for them to have joy for all of eternity. And praise God that we were able to serve alongside our community yesterday in that way. I was talking with Jason, Kaylee's dad, yesterday. And I asked him if I could share this with you. And his response was, absolutely. If in any way our story can minister to others, that's totally and completely what we want. I was talking with him about how he's doing. A few years later, how's he doing with the loss of his daughter? One of the most gut-wrenching, heartbreaking things I believe someone can go through is losing a child. He was sharing with me how there's many days of sadness. Times where he's just overcome with brokenness, he has to step away from whatever he's doing and just bawl, often uncontrollably. The tears flow. But he shared with me how his faith has been strengthened. And as I talk with him, with tears in his eyes, there's a joy in his spirit. There's a joy in his spirit because he he knows that even in the worst of situations, that God is working it together for his good. He knows that he'll see her again because of the work of Christ. He knows that in gut-wrenching loss, that God is redeeming it. He knows that in the end, it'll all be restored. He mourns and he hurts. But he has joy because of Christ. He ministered to my soul yesterday as I thought about our text this morning. What it looks like to go through the deepest possible pain. But still have the joy of Christ in his heart. Church family, I pray, I hope that you have a Christmas season, an Advent season that's marked by happiness. But the harsh reality is we live in a broken place. The harsh reality is that in this room there's loss, in this room there's hurt, in this room there's illness. But I just want to remind you that you have joy in Christ. You have joy in Christ that the circumstances of this world cannot take away from you. You have joy, biblical joy, choosing to respond to external circumstances with inner contentment because we know that God will use our experiences to accomplish his work in and through our lives.
you're here today and you don't know Christ, my question for you is, is do you want to know about this joy? Do you want to know about this joy? To know this joy, all you have to do is repent and believe. Say, Jesus is Lord, he, he's Savior. I, I believe the work that he did is true. I believe it was on my behalf. I put my faith in him. Then You have this, this joy, this transcending joy, and no matter what you face, no matter what season you're in. If that's you, I'd love to chat with you. I'll be down front as we respond. I'd also ask for the Christians in the room. Is the joy that you have from the transformational work of Christ revealed in your life? Is it revealed in your life? Do, do people see you as someone that is filled with joy? I just want to remind you that God is working. No matter where you find yourself, God's working. Well, whatever you face, he's there wherever you're at. In him, church, you have joy. Let us pray. God, we thank you today for this reminder from the book of Isaiah. The reminder in the middle of this book uh, where there, there's judgment, there's this future hope. Uh, in the middle of this book where there's just a lot of darkness. This, this beacon of light here in chapter 35 that reminds us of the joy. Even in a broken space, even in a broken place, even in our broken lives, that there can be joy through the work of Christ. God, this Advent season... God, my prayer, my, my hope is that our community, that the watching world around us would see the joyfulness in our hearts. That the joyfulness would be winsome and that people would come into contact with the living God. God, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, God, I pray that through the preaching of your word, God, I, I pray that the Spirit would work in their heart, that they would repent and they would believe. God, they, they would find this unending joy that can only be found in Jesus. God, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you so much uh, for using us individually to witness in our community, to show the joy that is within us. God, we, we thank you so much for, for using us collectively. God, we thank you and we praise you for that. God, as we go through this season, let us be a people that are seen as joyful and let us sing of the great joy that we have because of Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.